Hello, friends and fellow nosy bitches. It's good to be back. We are back for day 14 of the George Wagner the Fourth trial. I am a few days late on this. Um, and it's had a really busy weekend and end of the week last week with work and some uh, stuff with my son's football game. And we have my birthday party this weekend. So we're a little behind, but we're going to get caught up today. So let's get into it. All right, on Friday, September the 30th, um, we had day 14 of the trial. Um, it should have been day 15, but if you recall, we did not have court the day before on Thursday, uh, would have been the 29th. Like I said, I can't stop yawning for some reason. I am absolutely exhausted. Um, I guess that's the reason. <laughs> Anyway, so we found out that the day before a juror, or two days prior on Wednesday the 28th after court was over, a juror had mentioned to the bailiff that she was not feeling well, and a further conversation was had on Wednesday night, deciding to cancel court Thursday because apparently she was having COVID symptoms. She is okay, but she has been excused as a juror. And they have brought one of the alternates in to permanently take her place as one of the 12. So we are down to approximately five alternates. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a long night making these videos if I can't quit yawning. All right, so we started out uh, day 14, the 29th, with April Manley. She is the sister-in-law of Dana Roden and the wife to James Manley. If you remember back when we discussed the crime scenes and the initial discovery of the bodies, it was James Manley who discovered his sister Dana in her bed, and he is the one that was talking about the pillow being stuck to her face. April was not originally with him. He was with Bobby Joe Manley, which I believe is his other sister. And when he called to say that he had found Dana, um, April came down to be with him. She stated she'd slept in a recliner the night before because she had a severe case of bronchitis and um, later had to wake up her sons to get them off to school. James Manley was a logger and would normally be at work, but it had rained heavily the night before, so he was off work that day. Um, she said she remembered him leaving, that he said he was going to Chris Sr.'s house with his parents. Her son, Cody, was also in the house. He worked with Frankie Roden, and they carpooled to work together. And obviously, Frankie did not show up. Head to part two. We are back. Part two of day 14 of the George Wagner IV trial. April Manley testified that her son, Cody, tried several times to call Frankie, thinking that he had overslept um, as they carpooled to work in the morning. I swear. It's going to be a long one today, guys. Um... Anyway, she recalls her husband coming, which is James Manley, coming back home and telling her that Dana was also dead, um, which is what she testified, you know, verbatim. But I'm assuming that by the time he came back to say that Dana was also dead, she was aware that Chris was dead and Gary was also dead. She said that James and Dana were very close and that they had an unbreakable bond and that he was an emotional wreck. And um, he also mentioned to her, and this is really sad, and again, I try to put a trigger warning when we start talking about the babies, because stuff like this can really upset people, but just know all these babies were fine. I mean, emotionally, maybe not, but all the babies physically were not harmed. He said that when he was in Dana's house, he did not go back and check on Hannah Mae Roden, because he could hear baby Kylie, who at this point, I believe, was four days old crying and he knew what kind of mother Hannah was and that she wouldn't just let a baby cry like that. So he knew something was wrong with her and I guess probably decided he didn't want to see that, that he had seen enough, which is fair. That's, that's absolutely fair. April Manley also testified and brought up the fact that Originally, at the time, they could not find Chris Jr., and actually, the day of the murders, there was a theory going around for a while, and even law enforcement has come out and said that they did have to consider him a suspect for a while. 
Now, obviously, he was not a suspect. They did find his body in his bed, and he was deceased. The investigators, uh, first responders, I suppose, came out, asked um, April Manley to draw a map of the house um, because it did have different additions to it um, to try. To, and Hannah May's room was in an addition. Um, and then Chris Jr., his truck was not there because it had been taken away by his father. But that added to the confusion of where Christopher Jr. was, which also helped in the maybe he was involved theory that pretty quickly went away. April Manley did ride in the ambulance to Adams County Regional Medical Center with baby Kylie uh, to be checked out. And while at that hospital, she did have a run-in with Jake Wagner. So head over to part three. We'll start weaving him into this. Day 14, part three. April Manley testified that she rode with a four-day-old, five-day-old baby Kylie to Adams County Regional Medical Center, a hospital about 25 minutes away from the crime scenes, which I thought was funny. I was reading comments on a post on Facebook talking about how that hospital was 25 minutes away, but Southern Ohio Medical Center, where Kylie was born, was 30 minutes away. And so many people could not believe that we live that far away from the hospital. Like, I thought it was actually doing pretty good that SMC is only about 25 minutes from us. Um, Apparently, that's not good to live that far away from the hospital. Um, So, there's that. Anyway, she testified that she was outside of Adams County Regional Medical Center smoking a cigarette. And up came Jake Wagner. She said that he was, quote-unquote, emotionless and wasn't worried about Hannah. Wasn't He was, quote-unquote, sorry, emotionless, dot, 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 wasn't worried about nothing, wasn't someone who just lost someone they claimed to love, end quote. Sorry, that was a little scattered. I'm reading the uh, recap from WCPO um, Channel 9 out of Cincinnati. This is Evan Millward. April said that Jake hugged her, which later bothered her because she wondered if he still had her baby's blood on him. Meaning, of course, Hannah Mae Roden. Jake Wagner was at Adams County Regional Medical Center because he wanted to take baby Kylie with him. He was there to take the baby that wasn't his, that he knew wasn't his. To take that baby home. That's the type of family we're dealing with here. That not only was he there to get the baby. You know damn well his mom was the one who was supporting this. Saying yes go get that baby. You know this bitch was. He was obviously told no. He still believed he was the father of the baby. Even though they had already told him the math ain't mathin. And you are not the baby's father. Charlie Gilly is the baby's father. They've, of course, since confirmed that with DNA, and it the father is Charlie Gilly. April Manley also testified that the Wednesday before the murder, so day, two days prior, the murders were on a Friday morning. Um, she had been at Dana's new home that she had been in for less than a month. Uh, she said she'd been there several times. She made the curtains. She helped paint the kitchen. And that on Wednesday, Jake was there showing Hannah Mae how to set up that cute little baby crib that I loved so much in the living room for Kylie because it had belonged to their baby, Sophia. So head over to part four. Day 14, part four. According to April Manley's testimony, Jake Wagner did not like her, said that she was nosy, and apparently told Hannah that April needed to mind her business. Um, She kind of had that nosy vibe to be real honest but uh and that apparently april manley didn't like jake either so it was pretty mutual and that so far has been the uh general consensus of anybody who knew pretty much any member of this family they all kind of hated all of them april manley testified that jake was controlling of hannah may and she said that hannah may had quote unquote always been a little a chunky little monkey end quote And she had lost a lot of weight while dating Jake because Jake would call her fat and tell her to stop eating. His skinny ass has that written all over him, honestly. I don't doubt that for a second. 
April Manley also testified that when Hannah May was 16 years old and a new driver, uh, the couple had gotten into a fight at April Manley's house, and Hannah May took off in her car and later called April Manley, saying that Jake was chasing her around at high speeds. Um, Hannah May parked and hid at the church on Union Hill Road until her father, Chris Sr., came to get her. Later at the funerals for the rodents, the mass funeral for six members, um, April said that Billy, Jake, and George all showed up. Billy had bruises on his face, and it was not explained. Um, there was a little bit of cross. She obviously hated these defense attorneys, but no more than her son, Cody, who was next to the stand. So that was it for April Manley. She was very emotional, very sad. So we will start next with her son, Cody. Small change in scenery. Um, I'm over here on my iPad now instead of my uh, computer. So next we had Cody Manley. Oh, I'm sorry, not Cody. Um, no, I'm right. I was right. Cody Manley. Sorry. I was getting him mixed up with Corey. My bad. This, they don't branch out much on the names. So Cody Manley is the son of April Manley and her husband, James, who is brother to Dana Roden. Just for a recap. Um, Cody is the one who rode to work with Frankie. Cody went over to Frankie's house thinking that he had possibly overslept and saw his aunt, Bobby Jo Manley, pulled over and thought, and there was a cop there. The yawning is out of control. But he thought that she had just been pulled over. He didn't realize what was going on, so he went into Frankie's house. And he went into his cousin's bedroom and froze, he said. The prosecutor asked, why did you freeze? And he said, quote unquote, because I saw something I didn't want to see. Go over to part five. George Wagner trial, day 14, part five. Cody mainly did state that when he got into Frankie's bedroom, he froze by the baby bed. Um, he could tell that both Frankie and Hannah Hazel were in bed and they were deceased. Um, there was a police officer in the house who told him to go back outside. Um, he froze. And was unable to respond. The cop told him to go outside again. And he listened and went back outside. He uh, went to find baby Brentley. Which was the three year old. And baby Ruger. Um, at this point baby Ruger had been brought out by law enforcement. And he did say that he called Chelsea. Um, baby Brentley's mom to come get Brent to get come get Brentley. Cody also stated that he went to the funerals and saw Billy, George, and Jake present at the funerals. On cross, uh, Richard Nash did it today. It says attorney John Nash. His name is Richard Nash, um, at least in Portsmouth it is. Um, he did the cross examination. Um, Cody did not like him. And don't take a drink every time Cody rolls his eyes because you'll die. Nash was mainly focused on the dogs. He wanted to know about Kenneth's dogs and Chris Sr.'s dogs, their names, their breeds, their sizes, if they were um, vicious dogs, that sort of thing. We did not get confirmation on what types of dogs these are, but their names were Chase and Brownie. Chase, or I'm sorry, Chance. Chance is Chris Sr.'s dog. Brownie was Kenneth Roden's dog. And according to Cody, these dogs were not nice to people that they didn't know and that people who didn't know them would not have gone in the house where the dogs were. At this point, they took their lunch break and after lunch, the uh, prosecution called uh, Kendra Roden, who is Kenneth's daughter with his ex-wife Stacy and the younger sister of Luke Roden that we heard from uh, about a week ago. Kendra testified that her and Hannah Mae Roden were only a couple of months apart in age and that they had grown up like sisters and were extremely close. She also testified that when Hannah Mae met Jake Wagner, he basically wouldn't let her come around, was cutting Kendra out of her life, that apparently him and Kendra didn't get along. Um, she talked about Hannah trying to hook up Kendra with George Wagner IV, which just, no, absolutely not. I would love for my friend to be like, oh my God, can meet my boyfriend. His brother is so great. And then show up and this half bald motherfucker she's standing there. Absolutely not. 
Kendra testified that Jake was demeaning to Hannah and very bad. And I'll go to the next part, and I'll tell you a fun story about the side of County. George Wagner, the fourth child, day 14, part six. Kendra testified to a story about going to the Scioto County Fair, um, which is a very large county fair. Um, it's my county fair, but it is a very large county fair. She testified to going to the Scioto County Fair with Jake, George, and Hannah as sort of a double date situation, which just, ew. But you know what? That sounds about right for the Scioto County Fair, honestly. So anyway, apparently at some point on this trip, Jake had said something demeaning my finger didn't bend, demeaning to Hannah and grabs her by the arm. Kendra turned around and kicked Jake in the shin. So good for her. He sucks. And apparently he said things back to her and Hannah had to get in between the two of them and separate them. Hannah allegedly told Kendra she just needed to get to know Jake better. And Kendra said, thanks, no thanks. She said that when Hannah Mae told her that she was pregnant with Jake's child. Kendra had hoped it was a joke, which is really sad, and that she had tried to be supportive during the pregnancy, but Jake would not allow um, Hannah Mae to be around Kendra. Now, through Kendra's testimony, we heard the word objection about 86 times. Um, they kept trying to say that a lot of what she's saying was hearsay, and a lot of it was, but some of it was not. She heard it firsthand, but the defense would like just not let the state get a word out before they would yell out objection. It was so annoying. But in their defense, Angela Canepa was not doing a great job today. Apparently, after Hannah Mae left Jake, she uh, reestablished her relationship with Kendra and they laid in bed listening to audio recordings that Hannah Mae had made on her phone, both phone conversations and in-person conversations. Oh my God phone conversations and in-person conversations that they had had between Hannah Mae and Jake. Um, she, she quote says, quote unquote, she not only told me, but had played audio recordings of Jake admitting to hitting her, choking her, pushing her against the wall. Hannah Mae never went back to Jake after this, by the way, which good for her, but uh, the damage was done. After the breakup, Kendra testified that she did hear conversations where Jake was telling Hannah that they would either raise Sophia as a unit, meaning the three of them, or she would give up Hannah entirely to Jake. Kendra also, also testified about Jake coming over to build the crib not long before Hannah Mae was murdered, um, saying that she had tried to get Jake to come before the move, but he wouldn't do it, and showed up on the Wednesday prior to the murders to do it. The night of the murders, Kendra was supposed to stay with Hannah, but was unable to due to babysitting, and that probably saved her life. Go to parts. I didn't realize this tape was going to have so many parts, and I also didn't realize there was no such thing as a flattering angle on this couch. So, here we are. Part 7. Later on during a meeting at the church is when Hannah found out that her father, Kenneth, had also been murdered, um, and she took off walking down Union Hill Road and was picked up by a friend and a highway patrol officer who stopped her because she said she just wanted to be with Hannah. And her her emotions on the stand were so sad. You could tell this was her sister, her best friend, and then she was absolutely heartbroken. But she did an amazing job making sure that she did her part to make sure that the people responsible for this are held accountable for what they've done to... Hannah Mae and her, I just thought they're up, <laughs> to make sure that they are responsible for what they did to Hannah Mae and her entire family. The defense attorneys uh, went through the, again with the objections, but the defense attorneys were asking her about a person called Big Mike, which is someone allegedly from the Cincinnati area. Um, and they've asked every, several family members about this. I don't know where they're going with this. Um, whatever. They also brought up the information that she had originally given to the investigators at BCI in 2016 when she was initially interviewed about Chris buying a building to start a pill mill. Um, but she told them that that was not firsthand knowledge that she had. That was hearsay at the time, and she was just passing on information that she had heard to help, potentially help aid in the investigation. 
Next up was Corey Holdren. This is uh, the boyfriend of Hannah Mae at the time she was murdered. He was an emotional wreck doing this testimony, and I, I believe him. He testified that he had been dating Hannah Mae for about a week when she found out she was pregnant. Um, the, um, the information that he had at the time was that Charlie Gilly was the father. Charlie Gilly was on pain pills and had no interest in stopping them. So Hannah had broken up with him. Uh, him and Hannah Mae originally broke up, but got back together after he saw on Facebook that she had been in a car accident and reached out to her to see if she was okay. They started talking again and started their relationship back up. Hannah Mae helped um, Corey withdraw from pain pills as well, staying by him through his withdrawals, uh, laying by him, sitting by him, and said that you only do that if you love someone, which was heartwarming. Go to the next part. Part eight of the George Wagner trial. I'm going to try to wrap this up in this one. I'm exhausted. Corey Holdren testified that he, while he knew Charlie was the father of the baby, out of his love for Hannah Mae and his desire to have a family, he decided to make it work with her and was there through the entire pregnancy and was there for the birth and even cut uh, Kylie's umbilical cord and picked out her name. He, of course, agreed to take care of Kylie, love her, and raise her as his own, which... I've always thought it's amazing when someone can do that and is willing to love another man's child as their own because blood does not make family. Corey testified that Hannah was an amazing mother to Sophia even when the toddler was rotten and he said that I just wish Kylie could have seen and he cried and I kind of wanted to cry with him. Uh, Corey testified that the night of the murders, he would have been in bed with Hannah Mae, but his mother had called and begged him to go to his sister's house to look for a leak because I guess they got a huge water bill and they had a leak underneath the trailer. Hannah was going to go back home, pick up her breast pump and come meet him and stay with him. Um, but she ultimately decided that she was too tired and that she would see him the next day. And their last texts together were saying that they loved each other. And honestly, this water pipe is probably the only reason that Corey Holdren was not also murdered that night. The next day, Kendra informed Corey uh, about the murders and told them that they were gone. He rushed there, was informed by Hannah Mae's grandparents that they were all, in fact, murdered. Corey testified that Hannah had told him a lot of things about her relationship with Jake that he was controlling and that the family, the Wagner family, while she lived with them, had kept her locked in a bedroom for six months without allowing her to see anyone. Even when her father came to the house, she was not allowed to see him. He also testified that one day Jake came to his house um, mad about mad at Hannah for being late and Corey went so far as to invite Jake in. Jake came inside. He showed up and knocked on my door. I invited him in. He came in and sat on my couch, sat down in my house and everything. This is about a week before it happened. He said to this day that he feels like the death of Hannah was a prank and that he expects her to come walking in the room at any moment, which is honestly just heartbreaking. Uh, they did not cross-examine him. And after him, they called uh, Chelsea Robinson, the mother of Frankie's oldest child, Brentley. Had to think of it. But she opted to not be recorded or videoed. So they adjourned once they rested and she was crossed this morning. So we'll do the rest later. I sincerely apologize for the lack of energy today. I'm just not, not there. We'll finish it up tomorrow. Um, we'll do day 15, uh, possibly 16, depending on what they cover tomorrow. Um, they covered a good bit today, but they didn't uh, televise it. So I'll have to read the summaries. Um, only, I think, two witnesses were um, shown today, but one of them was Tabitha. Yes, the Tabitha, Bullvine's mother. So, um, the looks, now I did see some clips of this. I'm not all the way through watching it yet, but I watched some clips of this, and George is staring daggers through her. He's so pissed, and she did an amazing job. She held up and she stared him right in the face. 
So good for her. We also went over a good bit of George Wagner's tattoo, and I finally found a picture of it. Now, I don't remember if I discussed this tattoo before, but apparently after the murders, he did get a tattoo of the dead man's hand, which is a very famous poker hand. It's, um, I don't remember who was holding it, but somebody uh, was holding it when they were murdered, um, a Wild West outlaw. Um, it is aces and eights. This is the picture I found. It's a little hard to see, but obviously right down here, there is a skull. Um, if you look like kind of down there, uh, you can see kind of the outline of an ace. And then if you look in the skull's mouth, there is an eight ball. You can probably see it better without my big fat head, but over here, all the way on the left bottom corner of the screen, you can see what looks like a playing card there. And there are either four aces or a dead man's hand with the eights. Now, of course, people have said if it's four aces, that's four Wagners, eight ball for eight people that were murdered and the skull for the murder. Other people have said if it's a dead man's hand, same thing, dead man, eight people, commemorative tattoo. And this was a cover up as part of that picture. Um, I didn't save the whole thing. I just saved that. It did show a side view where he used to have a tattoo and this covered it up. So it was done as a cover up tattoo. So it was done on purpose. It was designed. And it's a little sketchy. Also, in uh, reference to the funerals, here's uh, two more angles of the same funeral. This right here is Billy. Back here is George. And this is Jake over here in the hat. You can see how dark uh, George's hair is. Here's a better picture of Jake um, right there and George together. You can see how dark their hair is and compared to their dad's how dark it is. And this is the same hat and hairstyle that he would have had in his interview uh, with the police. Pause to see. Here's the whole picture of the cover-up tattoo.